And I'm moving my microphone right over here so that I actually sound correct. You can tell how prepared I am for my stream. So here we go. Hopefully the mic volume and everything is pretty solid there. But yeah, so today, let's see here. It was weird we talked about butterfly dying unlike love. About a butterfly dying unlike love. Interesting. Poetry is abstract in that way. I don't quite follow what you're saying there, Panda, but I'm sure in context it makes a lot of sense. But getting back to what I was saying, life is tough right now, and it's exacerbated by the fact that we have all this extra time. And so I wanted to get on and read you guys some poetry and read you guys some stories, and hopefully maybe you can listen to this when you're going to bed or when you've you're in the car or you find yourself with just an abundance of free time and you need something to do but you don't want to sit down and read a book yourself so you'd rather listen to me drone on and on and talk about a book so the way that this is going to work or the way that i have this planned out and again i'm always open to suggestions but i thought that when i am reading i will actually read through the book and or whatever passage that i'm reading and then i don't really want to stop like we're going to be jumping into some poetry here in a second. So what I'll do is I'll read a poem and then I'll kind of do a reflection or give my opinion on it. And then after that, I'll check on chat and everything like that. But I'm not really going to be looking at chat while I'm reading. So you just kind of have to wait for those breaks in between. And I will also preface this by saying that I'm not like a literary analyst. I'm not an English person by any stretch of the imagination. There are probably oh, so many other people that are rightfully academically qualified to analyze these books using pragmatic approaches that are well vetted and stuff like that but i just think some of the books are cool so i just want to read them and then give them my take and if you use my citations or you use my ideas for like an essay or something like that that's totally free to do that by the way you can use my critique if you want for the purposes of a like an essay or something like that but just realize that I'm kind of a layman when it comes to these things. I don't have a degree in English. So some of my insights might not be as groundbreaking as if you were to read somebody who's studied these authors or studied these stories extensively. So with that in mind, let's talk about our first book and our first author. So as you can see, right over here, everything's reversed. Right over here, we're gonna be crouching into this book, The Prophet by Cahill Gilbron. And I'll give you guys a little bit of an insight. So I want to do these like introductions before I start reading all of my stories. So Pika, or sorry, Pika, Panda said that you should meet Mr. Yasko. Hmm. Is he like a streamer or something like that? Does he do reading and literature and stuff like that? He sounds like a nice guy. I'll have to check him out. But yeah, so Cahill Gabron. Cahill Gabron was a... Lebanese-American author. His full name is Gibran Cahill Gibran, so it's kind of a repeat. His first name and last name are the exact same, but he went by Cahill when growing when he was growing up, or Khalil, I should say. I always say Cahill, but it's actually Khalil. There's a second L in there. So Khalil Gibran, and he is a, like I said, a Lebanese-American poet, visual artist, and philosopher, although he kind of rebuked the title of philosopher later down the road. Mr. Yasko is your high school literature teacher. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I, I have a special place in my heart for literature teachers. They, uh, they do a lot of interesting stuff and they help inspire the young generations to read, which is an important thing. You guys should read every day. So getting back to it. So our good buddy Khalil, he was born on January 6th, 1883, and then he died on April 10th, 1931. And he was aged 48 when he died. He is most known for his works of poetry, including The Three Ants, The Broken Wings, and his most popular work, The Prophet, which is what we're going to be reading today. So a little bit more on that book. The Prophet is a book of 26 poems. It has been translated into 100 languages, making it one of the most translated books in history. And it follows the prophet al-Mustafa as he's leaving the city of Orphalace. Orphalace is, I guess, a, I, can't, I didn't get a chance to research it, but I think it's a city in kind of the area of Lebanon and that sort of area, but I'll have to look it up later. And he's lived there for 12 years and he's about to hop on a boat and leave Ophelis to go back to his homeland. But before he goes, these people track him down 
And I guess he was like a, a local prophet or a local philosopher and they see him going and they're like, wait, 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 we have a couple things that we want to ask you about before you go. And so the 26 poems of the prophet are his response to what the people ask him. So you'll hear the people in this book. I haven't read all the poems. Well, I think, I'm think i sure I've read them all at one point, but I haven't read them contiguously at one time. So this will be kind of going through the poems one by one for me and for you guys as well. But when, it, when you read the poems, there's going to be at the start, they'll usually say, and then the people asked him dot, dot, dot. And then it's the prophet's response. So that's kind of how this is structured. And one thing that I immediately notice, I don't know if he did this intentionally, Gibran, I mean, but these stories or this kind of call and response is very sort of biblical in nature. It sounds a lot like Jesus talking. So I don't know if there's supposed to be a parallel between Jesus and the prophet Al Mustafa, but um, that's just one thing that I saw. And again, I think that a lot of these styles of literature kind of mimic that biblical sort of prose where Jesus is teaching and that sort of thing. But that's just one thing that I think about with this book. So let me catch up on chat here really quickly. He's so cool. He gives off so many dad vibes and he loves poems and you guys get along. Well, that sounds great. He sounds like a really nice dude. I, I dig that. And, uh, Poetry is important. I have a collection of poetry books somewhere. I like American poetry, so I like a lot of Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, those sort of things. But I have, I literally have three po poetry books right next to them. I have the works of Edgar Allan Poe, the works of Walt Whitman, and then the works of Lord Byron. So those are my top three. So Edgar Allan Poe, Walt Whitman, and Lord Byron, which he had an actual name, not Lord Byron, but I can't remember what his name is off the top of my head. He's told you so many funny stories. I love that. I love when teachers can kind of joke around with their students and all that good stuff. Because a lot of people think of teachers as like these intimidating folks, but teachers are people just like you. So I like when they're kind of a little bit more fun and outgoing. So without further ado, let's crack into this. This is The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. Oh, wait, I have one more thing to say before we jump into it. So just kidding. This is actually one of my grandma's favorite books. So she had this book memorized at some point and she would go to bars and like recite poetry on the piano or these are the stories that she tells me so she would go to bars and like recite poetry on the piano or wherever they are and she would recite like Cahill Gibran and other poets and apparently that's how she picked up guys back in the day so as you know the mad lad lineage starts strong with my grandma and down through to me and so, like I said, I'm going to be reading each of these poems sequentially, or I'm going to be reading the book sequentially. And after each poem, I'm going to do kind of a reaction and give you my input on all this sort of stuff. And as we're going along, definitely in chat, if you're interested, or if you feel something that's like really fire, or, you know, Gibran is dropping bars, definitely let me know in the, in the chat and we can talk about it. So without further ado, here is The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. Let's see here. I don't know where the publication page is for this. Uh, this power came, shh, the books of kill. Oh, this is the books. Oh, here we go. So in case you didn't know, every book has at the beginning a publication page. That's this one right here. And it'll tell you when the book was first published, its ISBN number, if it has one. And sometimes, especially for American printings, they will have the Library of Congress reference number. So if you go to the Library of Congress, you can look it up. And then you can tell when it was first published and then the current edition, and then who published it originally and who published it currently. So this first was published in November 1926, and it was reprinted 13 times. This is the 15th printing, so 15th edition from November of 1971. So this book is older than I am by like 23 years. I was born in 94, 94 minus 23, yep, 71. So yeah, and this is a Barozzi book. So Barozzi book published by Alfred A. Knopp Incorporated. I, I was reading, I was doing some research, uh, Barozzi, I don't know if they're a publisher or if that's like a style of writing, I'll have to look that up. And then it was manufactured in the United States of America. So that's the publication page. So now let's get into this. I'm gonna set a little bit of ambiance here. So remember, Al Mustafa is at a harbor and he's about to get onto a boat and the people stop him. So take a second, kind of close your eyes, center your mind, 
and pretend you're just on the the dock of a harbor and you're with a crowd of people you may hear some murmuring and some talking maybe you came with a friend or your family to see this prophet and see him off maybe you're talking to them think about what you're talking about maybe some of the curiosities of what he's about to say and i'm going to set some ambiance here i'm going to play a little track here so that we can get into the mood This is The Prophet by Cahill Gobron. Al-Mustafa, the chosen and beloved, who was a dawn unto his own day, had waited twelve years in the city of Orphalese for his ship that was to return and bear him back to the isle of his birth. And in the twelfth year, on the seventh day of Yule, the month of reaping, he climbed the hill without the city walls and looked seaward and he beheld his ship coming with the mist. Then the gates of his heart were flung open, and his joy flew far over the sea, and he closed his eyes and prayed in the silence of his soul. But as he descended the hill, a sadness came upon him, and he thought in his heart, How shall I go in peace and without sorrow? Nay, not without a wound in the spirit shall I leave this city. Long were the days of pain I have spent within its walls. And long were the nights of aloneness. And who can depart from his pain and his aloneness without regret? Too many fragments of the spirit have I scattered in these streets. And too many are the children of my longing that walk naked among these hills. And I cannot withdraw from them without a burden and an ache. It is not a garment I cast off this day, but a skin that I tear with my own hands. Nor is it a thought I leave behind me but a heart made sweet with hunger and with thirst. Yet I can tarry no longer. The sea that calls all things unto her calls me, and I must embark. For to stay, though the hours burn in the night, is to freeze and crystallize and be bound in a mold. Fain would I take with me all that is here, but how shall I? A voice cannot carry the tongue, and the lips gave it wings. Alone must it seek the ether, and alone and without his nest shall the eagle fly across the sun. Now, when he reached the foot of the hill, he turned again towards the sea, and he saw a ship approaching the harbor, and upon her prow the mariners, the men of his own land. And his soul cried out to them, and he said, Sons of my ancient mother, you riders of the tides, how often have you sailed in my dreams? And now you come in my awakening, which is my deeper dream. Ready I am to go, and my eagerness with sails full set awaits the wind. Only another breath will I breathe in the still air, only another loving look cast backward. And then I shall stand among you, a seafarer among seafarers. And you, vast sea, sleepless mother, who alone are peace and freedom to the river and the stream, only another winding will this stream make. Only another murmur in the glade, and then I shall come to you, a boundless drop in a boundless ocean. And as he walked, he saw from afar men and women leaving their fields and their vineyards and hastening towards the city gates. And he heard their voices calling his name and shouting from field to field, telling one another of the coming of his ship. And he said to himself, Shall the day of parting be the day of gathering? And shall it be said that my eve was in the truth of my dawn? And what shall I give unto him who has left his plow in mid-furrow, or to him who has stopped the wheel of his winepress? Shall my heart become a tree heavy laden with fruit I may gather and given unto them? And shall my desires flow like a fountain that I may fill their cups? Am I to harp the hand of the mighty that may touch me, or a flute that his breath may pass through me? A seeker of silences am I, and what treasure have I found in silences that I may dispense with confidence? If this is my day of harvest, in what fields have I sown the seed, and in what unremembered seasons? If this indeed be the hour in which I lift up my lantern, it is not my flame that shall burn therein. Empty and dark shall rise my lantern, and the guardian of the night shall fill it with oil, and he shall light it also. These things he said in words, 
But much in his heart remained unsaid, for he himself could not speak his deeper secret. And when he entered into the city, all the people came to meet him, and they were crying out to him with one voice. And the elders of the city stood forth and said, Go not yet away from us. A noontide have you been in our twilight, and your youth has given us dreams to dream. No stranger are you among us, nor a guest, but our son and our dearly beloved. Suffer not yet our eyes to hunger for your face. Then the priest and the priestesses said unto him, Let not the waves of the sea separate us now, and the years you have spent in our midst become a memory. You have walked among us a spirit, and your shadow has been a light unto our faces. Much have we loved you, but speechless was our love, and with veils has it yet been veiled. Yet now it cries aloud unto you, and would stand revealed before you. And ever has it been that the love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. And others came also and entreated him, but he answered them not. He only bent his head, and those who stood near saw his tear falling upon his breast. And he and the people all proceeded towards the great square before the temple. And there came out of the sanctuary a woman whose name was Almitra, and she was a seeress. And he looked upon her with exceeding tenderness, for it was she who had first sought and believed in him when he had been but a day in their city. And she hailed to him, saying, Prophet of God, in quest of the uttermost, long have you searched the distances for your ship, and now your ship has come, and you must needs go. Deep is your longing for the land of your memories, and the dwelling place of your greater desires, and our love would not bind you, nor what our needs hold you. Yet this we ask ere you leave us, that you speak to us and give us your truth, and we will give it unto our children, and they unto their children and it shall not perish. In your aloneness you have watched with our days, and in your wakefulness you have listened to the weeping and the laughter of our sleep. Now, therefore, disclose us to ourselves, and tell us what has been shown to you, of which is between birth and death. And he answered, People of Orphalese, of what can I speak save what is even now moving within your souls? Then said Alamitra, Speaker, speak to us of love. Okay, so now we're getting into the poems. Perfect. So that's the first section. So here we see Almafasa. As we said, we're establishing everything. He's about to leave on the boat, and he's a little bit sad. He's sad that he's leaving this place that he's been here for twelve years, and no doubt. I mean, you spend anywhere, you spend any time anywhere for twelve years, and you kind of get attached to it in some way, and. Here he is. Clearly, he's made an impact on these people. He, people have come to him and they said that he's been a light unto their path and everything like that. Let me read back here. You have walked among us in spirit and your shadow has been a light upon our faces. That is, to me, seems like a biblical illusion because there's a psalm in the book of Psalms. I can't remember exactly which one, but it says, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto my path. So it's interesting that they use the the light analogy here or Gabran is using the light analogy here as it was used in the Bible. So that's one parallel that I've drawn as well. But here we can see a very kind of intense emotional recounting of the feeling of loneliness that the prophet Al Mustafa is feeling because he's about to leave and clearly he's distraught. And so he's going to humor these people one more time as they ask him questions about the things that he's wanting to talk about or what they want to know from him as they said people of Orphalese of which can I speak or sorry now therefore disclose us to ourselves and tell us what that has been shown of you which is between birth and death so all the things that he's experienced in life tell us more about that and in that way it's kind of like a eulogy too it seems like maybe the boat is kind of a metaphor for the prophet leaving maybe he's not leaving to the land of his home maybe he's actually dying or passing on and the people have come to view him or hear his last words so we'll never know but the the analogy or the similarity between the boat and kind of you dying is a very strong one i would say so here's the first poem about love then Sal said alamitra speak to us on love and he raised his head and he looked upon the people and there fell a stillness upon them and with a great voice he said when love beckons to you follow him though his ways are hard and steep 
and when his wings unfold you yield to him and though a sword hidden among his pinions may wound you and when he speaks to you believe in him though his voice may shatter your dreams as north wind lays waste to the garden for even as love crowns you you shall so crucify you or he shall so crucify you even as, even as he is for your growth so he is for your pruning even as he ascends to your height and caresses your tenderest branches that quiver in the sun so shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth like sheaves of corn he gathers you unto himself he threshes you to make you feel naked he sifts you free from your hurks or your husks he grinds you to whiteness he needs you until you are pliant and he assigns you his sacred fire that you may become bread for god's sacred feast all of these things shall love do unto you that you may know the secrets of your heart and in that knowledge become a fragment of life's heart but in your fear you would seek only love's peace and love's pleasure then it is better for you that you cover your nakedness and pass out of love's threshing floor into the seasonless world where you shall laugh but not all of your laughter and weep but not all of your tears love gives not but itself and takes not but from itself love possesses not nor would it be possessed for love is sufficient unto love when you love you should not say god is in my heart but rather i am in the heart of god and i think not you can direct the course of love for love if it finds you worthy directs your course love has no other desire but to fulfill itself but if you love and must needs have desires let these be to your desires to melt and be like a running brook that sings its melody to the night to know the pain of too much tenderness to be wounded by your own understanding of love and to bleed willingly and joyfully to wake at the dawn with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving to rest at the noon hour and meditate love's ecstasy to return home and eventide with gratitude and then to sleep with a prayer for the beloved in your heart and a song of praise unto your lips so that's the prophet speaking on love so very romantic notion here i'm going to take a sip of water really quickly we see this a lot poets like to exhume a lot on the purposes of love and we see this a lot one of the most classic stories is romeo and juliet and how these two young people are so utterly infatuated with each other and then Byron has talked about love extensively and that's kind of why a lot of people get into poetry a lot of people start reading poetry because it's like oh it's so romantic I love it I just love the way that the poets weave their words and talk of these romantic gestures and meeting in the moonlight and making out and all these other things but I think Gilbron does a great job here in illustrating that love can also be kind of harmful love can hurt you a little bit of time and you can see this in the let's see one more second sorry i'm trying to find the exact line though his voice may shatter your dreams as the north wind lays waste to the garden for even so as love crowns you so shall he crucify you even as he is for your growth so he is for your pruning even as he ascends to your height and caresses your tenderest branches that quiver in the sun so shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth so a lot of juxtaposition used here juxtaposition is when you put two things side by side for literary or dramatic effect so you have a high and you have a low love will allow you to feel the warmth of the sun as you grow but it'll also go to the roots and absolutely shake you bare it will open up your heart but it can also close up your heart it can hurt you or it can love or sorry it can make you grow or it can hurt you in a way and so i think gibran like i said does a great job of illustrating that there's a harsh part to this too there is tough love like love can be kind of hurtful at times too but it's all in the name of helping you grow and again he's really optimistic because as he says towards the end and think not that you can direct the course of love for love if it finds you worthy directs your course so love is one of the purposes of life that's why we're here and sometimes it is suffering but we should sit here and we should take the suffering because it will lead us in our life towards better things 
And that's how he wraps things up here because he says, love has no other desire than to fulfill itself. But if you love and must need and have desires, let these be your desires to melt like a running book that sings its melody to the night, to know the pain of too much tenderness, to be wounded by your own understanding of love and to bleed willfully and joyfully to wake at the dawn with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving to rest at the noon hour and meditate on love's ecstasy to return home at eventide with gratitude and to sleep with the prayer for the beloved in your heart and a song of praise unto your lips. So these are these sort of things, these things that you want to achieve in life to melt in your love and just feel like beside yourself and feel like a, a running brook of emotion, I guess you can say, to know what it feels like to be too tender, or too loving, to be wounded by love. Again, to take that hurt, but to be willing to take it willfully and joyfully knowing that that's making you a better person and to take a nap at noon and meditate on love's ecstasy because napping is important definitely take naps i'm just kidding but yeah these are all these things so you're going to see this a lot with gilbron's writing gilbron is very about he's a very existential writer he talks a lot about the purposes of certain things x y and z and as he mentioned love is love does nothing love wants nothing more than to fulfill itself so it's very much like x talking about x so love talking about love life talking about life and how these sort of things fulfill themselves in a very existential way if that makes sense so yeah that was the prophet on love and now we'll talk about marriage then almitra spoke again and said and what of marriage master and he answered saying you were born together, and together you will be forevermore. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. Aye, you shall be together even the silent memory of God. But let there be safe spaces in your togetherness, and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but make, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Give one another your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone. Even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they may quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not to give into each other's keeping. For only the hand of life can contain your hearts and stand together yet not tear new together. For the pillars of the temple stand apart and the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. That's a short one. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Marriage. I'm not married, as you can see. No ring as of yet. I'll show you my other hand just to be sure. But companionship, I think the, the subtext here, he's talking about marriage, but I think in the modern kind of subtext, we're talking about companionship. And contextually, Gilbron lived in a time where, especially in Middle Eastern and Eastern cultures, there's a lot of dependency on the wo or the woman being dependent on the man. And it still kind of feels that way in some ways today, too. But thankfully, women are gaining a lot more independence and we love to see it. But here's Gilbron kind of putting forth an interesting idea that when you're married, you shouldn't be totally and utterly infatuated with one another. Instead, you should kind of give each other some space and you should provide for each other, but never provide in such a way that you are taking from yourself. That's what he's mentioning when he says you should eat of bread, but not from the same loaf and to sing and da to get dance together and be joyous, but let one of you be alone. So everybody needs their alone time. And it's important to remember that because especially when you're early in what I like to call like the getting to know you stages of a relationship, you definitely want to be with that person a lot of the time and you want to do everything together and things like that. But that can get you burned out really, really quickly. And I think Gabron knew this. And so he's saying humans are fiercely independent. Like we want companionship. We're biologically programmed to be, to have companionship, but we're also fiercely independent. We kind of need our own times. And so Companionship is best spent when you have two individuals that are close with each other, but not so close that, as he says here, that heaven's winds cannot sweep through between of you and things like that. So, yeah, putting forth a very 
controversial opinion at the time that love should be the two of you kind of together but not so together that it's toxic or it hurts you so we've gone through two poems so far and as you can see Gibran's very concise he's very lyrical and he's very romantic in his writing like he has these beautiful proses but he's also concise like it doesn't drag on forever and forever and so that's why I love this book is because if you have questions about any sort of thing like life or marriage or giving Gilbron has probably written a poem about it or something close to it in this book and you can go and read it in a couple minutes and kind of sit and meditate on it like we're doing right now so let's continue our journey with our good friend Khalil Gibran and his prophet Al Mustafa next we're going to be talking about children and a woman who has held a babe against her bosom said speak to us of children and he said your children are not your children they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you yet, they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children are living, and arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon his path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that, he fly, that flies, so he loves also the bow that is the stable. Now, I want to draw your attention to something in this poem specifically, because he and his i don't know if you guys can see that you probably can't but in this translation at least he and his are capitalized now typically pronouns aren't capitalized but in the bible when you refer to god or you refer to yeah god when you refer to god and they say he or his it's always capitalized. He, his, and him in the Bible are capitalized when referring to God. So I think here, at least in this translation, Gibran is referring to the archer as God. So that, keep that in mind as we go into this. And again, we see here Gibran's kind of love for the fierce independentness of humanity. We're all individual people. And as parents, we should acknowledge that of our children. And as children, we should acknowledge that of our parents. Because he says, for they come through you, but not from you. So the parent is kind of a vessel in that way, a vessel that nurtures and a vessel that brings the person up. But whenever you're doing that, it should be done so in a way that promotes independence and promotes freedom of thought within the individual. As mentioned here, for they have their own thoughts and you may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. So here he's saying that the children are the future. Their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, so the future, which we can't get to because we're old and tired when he's talking to the parents. So that's an interesting use there. And then finally, he gives the analogy of the archer. So the archer sets his mark upon the path to the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. So the archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite. Time is infinite. So looking forward into the great abyss that is the future, the unknown future. And he bends you, the parrot, with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. So he's putting on to parents, in this case, the archer, or as I read into it, the god or god or some sort of deity. He is bending you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. So it's on you as a parent to raise your children in such a way that they go far in life. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. So don't feel bad that you're being stretched or that God is giving you this challenge or the archer is giving you this challenge. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he also loves the bow that is stable. So he's giving you this challenge because he cares about you and he cares about your child as well. I like this one. This is one of the one of my more favorite ones. And again, it's all about that conciseness with Gibran. He's very concise and he's very eloquent and he gets everything boiled down really, really easy. And that's why I love reading his stuff because 
he keeps it really, really tight. So now let's talk about giving. And this is absolutely my favorite poem in this entire book. I've quoted this passage before and I'll get, when we get to it, I'll read it over a couple times when we do the analysis. But I have actually used quotes in this particular poem for stuff like that. Like I always go back and I read this on New Year's because it talks a lot about like the coming of the new year. And if you want to be more giving in the new year and things like that, you can read this one and it has a lot of allusions to that. So this is my absolute favorite section of the prophet, the passage on giving. Then said a rich man, speak to us of giving. And he answered, you give li little when you give of your possessions it is when you give of yourself that you truly give. For what are your possessions but things that you keep and guard for fear that you may need them tomorrow? And tomorrow, what shall tomorrow bring to overprudent dog burying bones and the trackless sand as he follows the pilgrims to the holy city? And what is fear of need but need itself? Is not dread of thirst when your well is full, the thirst that is unquenchable? There are those who give little of the much which they have, and they give it for recognition, and their hidden desire makes their gifts unwholesome and there are those who have little to give at all these are the believers in life and the bounty of life and their coffer is never empty there are those who give with joy and that joy is their reward and there are those who give with pain and that pain is their baptism and then there are those who give and know not pain in giving nor do they seek joy nor give with mindfulness of virtue they give as in yonder valley the myrtle breathes its fragrance into space. Though the hands of such as these, God speaks, and from behind their eyes he smiles upon the earth. It is well to give when asked, but it is better to give unasked through understanding. And to the open-handed, the search for one who shall receive is the joy greater than giving. And is there aught that you would withhold? And you have shall some day be given. Therefore, give now, that the season of giving may be yours and not in your inheritors. You often say, I would give, but only to the deserving. The trees in your orchard say not so, nor the flocks in your pasture. They give all that they may live. To withhold is to perish. Surely he who is worthy to receive his days and his nights is worthy of all else from you. And he who has deserved to drink from the ocean of life deserves to fill his cup from your little stream. And what desert greater shall there be than that which lies in the courage and the confidence, nay, the charity of receiving? And who are you that men should rend their bosom and unveil their pride, that you may seek their worth naked and their pride unabashed? See first that you yourself deserve to be a giver and an instrument of giving. For in truth, it is that life that gives unto life, while you who deem yourself a giver are but of witness. And you receivers... All of you are receivers. Assume no weight of gratitude, lest you lay a yoke upon yourself and upon him who gives. Rather, rise together, and with the giver of his gifts, as on wings. For to be over-mindful of your debt is to doubt his generosity, who then has the free-hearted earth for mother and God for father. Like I said, this is one of my favorites. The passage that I want you to really think about here is you give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. That's my favorite line or my favorite passage in this entire book. And as I've mentioned, this book is like a favorite of mine and a favorite of my grandma's. So if you take nothing else from this stream, take that part. You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. And then the reason for that, as he mentioned, is because these things that we have, they're temporal, they're temporary. You don't get to take them with you when you go. But your acts of service, the things that you do for others, those are the things that will precede you, that will write your legacy, that will make people remember you. People may think it's like, oh, he had a cool car, he had a cool house or something like that. But eventually the image of that starts to fade after a while. It's like, oh, what kind of car did Andrew drive? I know he had a nice car, but I can't remember which one. But And he also had this really nice house, but I don't remember exactly where it was or what it looked like. But people will never forget the good things that you do for them. People will never forget when you buy them dinner when they're hungry or when you give them some of your water when they're thirsty. And it's interesting that Gibran actually uses the analogy of drinking 
where is it? But it's better to get it into open hit search for one shall receive and there you would often say i would give but only to the deserving the trees in your orchard say not so nor the flocks in your pasture the orchid so the section of trees and the pasture these are two very natural things they are unabated by thought and by reason and stuff like that it's just a bunch of chickens running around and a bunch of trees that are growing but yet they give of themselves wholeheartedly an orchard always bears fruit or gives fruit undiscriminately. Like a fruit isn't going to look at you and be like, hey, I don't like your hair. I don't think you really need this fruit enough. It's just going to drop its fruit. And you're going to be able to pick that fruit up and eat it if you want. Same thing with a flock. A flock kind of doesn't think like, oh, you don't look so hungry. I'm not going to give myself up to slaughter. You take that chicken or you take whatever animal and then you render it and you eat it and you do so undiscriminately. Like the the natural thing is that you don't really have a say in how giving happens and gilbron reinforces that when he says for in truth it is life that gives unto life while you who deem yourself a giver are but a witness so life and the natural order of things and god are always going to give that's the natural order of things life gives unto life we're just kind of here to be the vehicle or to be the witness to that giving so that's a big takeaway in this sort of thing so if nothing else, to make a synopsis, give of yourself, give your time, give your skills, give your expertise, give wholeheartedly and without discrimination. There's no such thing as need. Well, there is such a thing as need, but there's more need and less need. But it's really not for you to say who needs your help and who does. Well, in a way it is, but basically be generous. Don't let the superfluous things hang you up. Just give kind of indiscriminately if you can. And remember that giving and giving of yourself is part of the natural order of things. To give of yourself is to truly give. And life gives unto life. So when you give upon yourself, you bear witness to the natural and beautiful process that is life giving unto itself. Of happiness being given unto happiness. Of glory being given unto glory. Of charity being given unto charity. So groundbreaking stuff. I love this passage, like I said. It's my favorite poem in this entire book. Next, let's talk about eating and drinking. Then an old man, a keeper of an inn, said, Speak to us of eating and drinking. And he said, Would that you could live on a fragrance of the earth, and like an air planet be sustained by light. But since you must kill to eat, and rob the newly born of its mother's milk to quench your thirst, let it be an act of worship. And let your board stand an altar on which the pure and the innocent of forest and plain are sacrificed for that which is pure and still more innocent in man. When you kill a beast, say to him in your heart, by the same power that slays you, I too am slain, and I too shall be consumed. For the law that delivered you into my hand shall deliver me into a mightier hand. Your blood and my blood is not, but the sap that feeds the tree of heaven. And when you crush an apple with your teeth, say to it in your heart, your seed shall live in my body, and the buds of your tomorrow shall blossom in my heart, and your fragrance shall be my breath, and together we shall rejoice through all the seasons. And in the autumn, when you gather the grapes of your vineyard for the winepress, say in your heart, I too am a vineyard, and my fruit shall be gathered for the winepress, and like new wine, I shall be kept in eternal vessels. And in the winter, when you draw the wine, let there be in your heart a song for each cup. And let there be in the song a remembrance for the autumn days, and for the vineyard, and for the wine press. Take a minute to take that in while I drink. Ironically, we're talking about eating and drinking, so I'm going to hydrate here. When you really think about it, eating can be something of a violent thing. Ask any vegan. I'm not vegan, but I can definitely understand vegans who do the vegan thing for the humanitarian aspect because factory farming and the slaughter of animals inhumanely and stuff like that is really nasty stuff, believe it or not. And so I think Gabron knew this. And I think he knew this because he was rooted in his faith because a lot of the imagery that you see here is somewhat biblical 
and I'll, I'll let you into some context here. So in the Old Testament, in Mosaic law or in you know Hebrew law, they used to have, whenever there was a feast day, you would have a lamb that you would sacrifice to God. And that would be kind of a ritual or a rite within the faith. And the way that you did it is that you lived with this lamb for a while you lived with it and you helped raise it and everything like that. And then when the feast day came, the Sabbath or whatever it may be, you would take the lamb to the temple and put it, you would put it over this like wall. And then the temple or the whoever is working the temple would take the lamb and they would slaughter it and they would render it. And they would do so in a holy way so that it was done in a sacramental way, in a, in a holy way. Because the Jews recognized that killing for the purposes of eating and for our sustenance was a vile act, but we kind of have to do it, so we should do it in the name of God or in the way that God would prefer us. And that's outlined in some of the old books. Like if you read Leviticus, everybody likes to cite the whole part, like don't eat shellfish, don't eat mixed fabrics and things like that but all those things were outlined in such a way and that's why kosher food is a thing too for a lot of hebrew people they eat kosher food because it is holy and it is rendered in such a way that is sacramental and holy so getting back to kahil gabron when he starts talking about when you kill a beast say to him in your heart by the same power that slays you i too am slain and i too shall be consumed so it's not for us to kill mercilessly like we're not here to determine life and death we are subject to the same wrath that may come down to us by God or our higher creator, whatever it may be. For the law that delivered you in my hand shall deliver me in a mightier hand. So in the same way that we are offering up a, an animal for slaughter or an animal for eating, so too will we be offered up on the last day. And your blood and my blood is not but the sap that feeds the tree of heaven. So it's kind of, I don't want to say nihilistic, but... It's a very it's a very humbling statement. It's Gibran saying that in the same way that I am slaying you for sustenance and your blood will go over the the dirt below us and stuff. So good read. Yes, yes. Hey Ty, what's going on? How's it going, buddy? You caught us, we're reading The Prophet by Cahill Gibran, and we were just talking about eating and drinking. So anyhow. So your blood is not but the sap that feeds the tree of heaven. So you will, eventually we will die too, and our blood will, you know, feed the tree of heaven. So it's, we are very close to the animals that we are killing for food and things like that. So we shouldn't be so holier than thou when we talk about it. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I got my Lurk command set up, so that's so cool. Lurky Turkey. Great to see you, Ty. I'm doing great. Enjoying some well-read Wednesday. We're sitting here reading some books and just chilling out. So thank you so much for stopping by. and Thank you for that, Lurk. So that's the natural living thing. That's like the organic thing. And then there's the animal, the apple, and then the grape and the wine. So we'll talk about the apple next. So the apple says, your seeds shall live in my body and the buds of your tomorrow shall blossom in my heart. And your fragrance shall be my breath. And together we shall rejoice through all the seasons. So when you're taking life from something or you're eating an apple, you're taking its seeds. And ideally you shouldn't eat the seeds because that's bad for your appendix. But when you eat the seed, it goes into you and then it flourishes from within you. So my read of that is that when you consume of natural things of like apples and stuff like that, you are consuming of the earth. You are becoming more united with the natural order of things around you so you should acknowledge and you should appreciate that they're growing or that this thing would have grown had you left it alone so it's on you now since you're consuming it to continue to grow yourself otherwise you would be doing a disservice to the thing that you're eating it's kind of abstract to think about that when you're thinking of oh i'm in service of an apple that i just ate but that's how i read into it and then finally, there's the analogy of the grapes and the wine press. And in the autumn, when you gather the grapes of your vineyard for the wine press, say in your heart, I too am a vineyard, and my fruit shall be gathered for the wine press. And like new wine, I shall be kept in eternal vessels. Think about eternal vessels. When we are pressed, we are put into eternal vessels. 
like when we die, we go into coffins or we are cremated and we're put into an urn. I think that's what he means by the eternal vessels here. And in winter, when you draw the wine, let there be a song in your heart for each cup. And let there be a song of remembrance for the autumn days and for the vineyard and for the wine press. So it may be hard to draw this analogy or it may be hard to draw this conclusion, but I think Gilbron here is not just talking about wine and celebrating, but he's talking about our own lives as well. Let there be a song for every cup. So everything that you do in life, let somebody remember it. And let there be a song of remembrance for the autumn days, that's your life and passing, and for the vineyard, the world that you live on, and the wine press, the way that you died. So have a song for each of these. People should know what your life was like, the good things that you did, where you grew up, and what grew you, the vineyard, and then the wine press, what eventually killed you, I guess. So it's kind of the full circle of humanity in that way. So yeah, there's a lot of illustration there are a lot of illusion in that particular writing so yeah i'm gonna pop over here to my channel just make sure that i am uh i sound good at everything like that here to my channel just make sure that i am uh I good i sound good cool hydration stream what's up no you're good are you good <laughs> you do you do <laughs> that's good fun stuff you see <clears throat> so my sister just walked in and she's coloring her hair and she just flushed all the color out of her head so she's got brown hair and uh she looks like coconut head from ned's declassified school survival guide so my sister just wanted to pop in. I think she's a little stream, so stream shy, so she didn't want to be on stream. But yeah, shout outs to A is for sister. So let's recap. We've talked about life. We've talked about children. We've talked about, well, sorry, we've talked about love. We've talked about marriage. We've talked about children. And now we've talked about eating and drinking. So there's some really existential stuff in there. There's some very temporal stuff in there. So love is existential. Marriage is temporal. Existential meaning it's like a big grand thing to talk about. And it's kind of hard to understand or wrap your head around. Marriage, it's temporal. It's pretty well understood by the layman. A lot of people get married and the ceremonies for marriage are pretty well laid out. So it's very temporal. So there's a dichotomy there. We've talked about children, again, a very temporal idea. So children, how you take care of kids is pretty well understood. You should take care of your kids and love them and nurture them. So he reflected on that and kind of reaffirmed a lot of that. And then finally, we just talked about eating and drinking, which is kind of temporal too. But in each of these, Gibran is keeping it really, really concise. He's keeping it really, really tight. And he's keeping, he's able to draw some pretty existential questions or some existential talks or things from these very temporal or down-to-earth things so now let's talk about work so this is a more existential thing we're talking about work and labor and things like that then a plowman said speak to us of work and he answered saying you work that you may keep pace with the earth and the soul of the earth for the, to be idle is to become a stranger unto the seasons, and to step out of one's life's procession. And that marches in majesty and proud submission towards the infinite. When you work, you are a flute, through whose heart the whispering of the hours turns to music. Which of you would be a reed, dumb and silent, when all else sings together in unison? Always you have been told that work is a curse and labor a misfortune. But I say to you that when you work and you fulfill a part of Earth's furthest dream, assigned to you when the dream was born, and in keeping yourself with labor, you are in truth loving life. And to love life through labor is to be intimate with life's innermost secret. But if you, in your pain, call birth and affliction and the support of the flesh a curse written upon you, your brow, then I answer that not 
but the sweat of your brow shall wash away that which is written. You have been told also that life is darkness, and in your weariness you echo that was said by the weary. And I say that life is indeed darkness, save where there is urge. And all urge is blind, save that which there is knowledge. And all knowledge is in vain, save what there is work. And all work is empty, save that where there is love. And when you work with love, you bind yourself to yourself, and to one another, and to God. And what is it to work with love? Is it to weave the cloth with threads drawn from your heart, even as your beloved were to wear that cloth? Is it to build a house with affection, even as your beloved were to dwell in that house? Is it to sow seeds with tenderness, and to reap the harvest with joy, even as if your beloved went to eat the fruit? Is it to change all that you fashion with the branch of your own spirit, and to know all that the blessed dead are standing about you and are watching? Often have I heard you say, as if speaking in sleep, he who works in marble and finds the shape of his own soul in the stone is nobler than he who plows the soil. And he who seizes the rainbow to lay it on the cloth in the likeness of a man is more than he who makes sandals for our feet. But I say, not in sleep, but in overwakefulness of noontide, that the wind speaks not more sweetly to the giant oaks than to the least of all the blades of grass. And he alone is great who turns the voice of wind into a song made sweeter by his own loving. Work is love made visible. And if you cannot work with love, but only with distance, it is better that you should leave your work and sit at the gate of the temple and take alms of those who work with joy. For if you bake bread with indifference, you bake a bitter bread that feeds but half a man's hunger. And if you grudge the crushing of the grapes, you grudge distills a poison in the wine. And if you sing as though angels, and not love the singing, you muffle a man's ears to the voices of the day and the voices of the night. Interesting. So, Gilbron here is not purporting anything due. He's basically saying that you should love what you do. But I think that he dives into a lot more of the reasoning behind it. This is one of Gilbron's longer poems, I would say. And I think it's because he feels so passionately about this. I want to draw your attention to the stanza here that when he's saying all of these and all urge and all knowledge and all work and that sort of thing, this kind of rapid fire stanza that he's doing here. You have been told a long also that life is darkness and your weariness you echo what say that be weary and i say that life is indeed darkness save where there is urge and all urge is blind save when there is knowledge so you have to know what you desire in order to find that light and all knowledge is vain save when there is work so your knowledge should bring you to your work so you should understand your work and you should work in a place that you are knowledgeable and all work is empty save where there is love so you should love what you do along with all those other things and when you work with love you bind yourself and to one another and to god so it's interesting that he's outlining all of this because it reminds me a lot of maslow's hierarchy of needs which i don't know if any of you guys have studied psychology but maslow basically outlined a a hierarchy of our needs as human beings and the first one is just to survive and it goes all the way up through like self-actualization and self-realization which is understanding what it is that you're meant to do and then going and doing that which is basically the purpose for life as he puts it and so gibran is actually breaking it down right here kind of saying all this at once so life is indeed darkness save where there is urge so you have to have desire to do something or your life is going to be completely dark and completely boring and all urge or desire, as I'm putting it, is blind, save where there is knowledge. So you have to understand why you have desires. You have to understand why it is that you urge towards something. And all knowledge is vain, save where there is work. So you have to work at understanding what it is that you want to do. And once you understand what it is that you want to do, then your life can have light. Otherwise, it's darkness. So he's building on top of these things, one after the other. And all work is empty, save where there is love. So unless you're doing something that you love that is built upon the knowledge that you have gained from working, which is built upon the urge that you understand that you need to work, which is what gives life meaning. So it's all coming together here. Then you are finally actualizing and you're doing what you love and that is to be near god as he puts it 
and it binds you to people around you. So when you do what you are meant to do and you have like gone through those steps, when you have realized that there's a desire to work, that you understand what it is that you want to do and that you work and you do that thing with love, then and only then are you really working and will you really enjoy yourself. And to do anything less is to leave yourself in utter darkness and utter shambles. So I like that stanza a lot. He's basically outlining it and just drawing it up for you. So that's work and labor. Now let's talk about joy and sorrow. So another dichotomy here. Then a woman said, speak to us of joy and sorrow. And he answered, your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And the self-same well for which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. It is not a cup that holds your wine, the very cup that is burned into the potter's oven, and is not the lute that soothes your spirit, the very wood that was hollowed with knives. When you are joyous, look deep into your heart, and you shall find it is only which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. When you are sorrowful, look again in your heart, and you shall see that there is truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Some of you say, joy is greater than sorrow, and others say, nay, sorrow is the greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come, and when one sits alone with you at the board, remember that the other is asleep upon your bed. Verily you are suspended like scales between your sorrow and joy. Once you are empty, you are at a standstill and balanced. When the treasure keeper lifts you to weigh with gold and his silver, needs must you joy or your sorrow rise or fall. Bars. That's bars, guys. Like, that's a perfect illustration of life isn't all cupped cakes and roses, but it's not totally despicable and despair either. We've got to have some bad to remind us of the good. We have to be, like he says, a lute. So think of a guitar. So if you think of like an acoustic guitar, a lute is kind of like an acoustic guitar. So somebody had to cut that tree and somebody had to hollow it out and make it like acoustic so that it can play stuff and all that process of removing it of that kind of barbaric removing of material and tearing away at it to make the wood that eventually becomes this beautiful instrument that's what gives the instrument its quality and as he mentioned is th is the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned into the potter's oven so didn't a potter work this cup into the mold and then he put it into a kiln into a fire at like a thousand degrees and fire it so that it becomes hard and able to hold wine our lives are like that too. Sometimes we have to get put into the kiln. Sometimes we have to get put into the the fire in order to be hardened and to be able to hold that sweet, sweet drink, that sweet, sweet wine. So nothing new here really being broken down by Gilbron, but I think at the time this was a very existential thing. Like we know now that life is kind of, you need to suffer a little bit and it's kind of, funny that a lot of people have taken on to that it's like oh i just need to suffer more it's like man life is just suffering and people say it ironically as kind of a joke but that really is the nature of a lot of modern thought experiments or modern schools of philosophy is that our our suffering is indispensable like we're always going to suffer but the chief task in life is to find the reason for that suffering and i always tell you guys on the stream i've said it before Whenever you're in a traumatic situation, you can ask two questions. You can ask why, or you can ask what. You can ask why is this happening to me, or you can ask what is this teaching me. When you ask what is, te what is this teaching me, that's when you are growing, and that's when you're learning, and that's how you justify the things and the terrible pain that you're feeling. But if you keep asking yourself why is this happening to me, then you're just going to be going in a self isolated circle. You're just going to be spinning your wheels and asking yourself why, why, why poor old me woe is me all that good stuff well all that bad stuff i should say it's bad stuff when you have this kind of existential weird feelings but that's the the crux of it find meaning in your suffering find why it is that the potter put you into that kiln to fire you and to become stronger and once you understand that you can come out of the oven and then you are stronger and you can hold that sweet sweet drink as they say or as I said, they don't say that. I said that. I said that on stream. Um, more water. I am talking up a storm here, so my throat is just a wee bit parched. Let's see here.
Hydro Flask boys. Let's see here. Cool. Just checking my phone, make sure I'm not missing anything too too crazy. And we're back. Top off my water here. Now, on to the topic of cribs. Houses, domiciles, the places that we live. Then a mason came forth and said, Speak to us of houses. And he answered and said, Build of your imaginings a bower in the wilderness, ere you build a house within the city walls. For even as you have homecomings in your twilight, so is the wanderer in you, the ever distant and alone. Your house is your larger body. It grows in the sun and sleeps in the stillness of the night. And it is not dreamless. Does not your house dream? And in dreaming, leave the city grove or the hilltop? Would that I could gather your houses into my hand, and like a sower, scatter them in the forest and meadow. Would the valleys were your streets, and the green paths your alleys, that you might seek one another through vineyards, and come with fragrance of the earth in your garments. But these things are not yet to be. In their fear, your forefathers gathered you too near together, and the fear shall endure a, lo a little longer. A little longer shall your city walls separate your hearths from your fields. And tell me, people of Orphalese, what have you in these houses? And what is it you guard with these fastened doors? Have you peace, the quiet urge that reveals your power? Have you remembrances, the glimmering arches that span the summits of the mind? Have you beauty that leads to the heart from the things fashioned of wood and stone till holy mountain? Tell me. Have you these in your houses? Or have you only comfort and the lust for comfort, that stealthily thing that enters the house as a guest and then becomes a host and then a master? Aye, it, become, it becomes a tamer and with hook and scourge makes puppet of your larger desires. Though, it hand, though its handles are silken, it, its heart is of iron. It lulls you to sleep only to stand by your bed and jeer at the dignity of the flesh. It makes mock of your sound senses and lays them in thistleton like a fragral vessel. Verily, the lust for comfort murders the passion of the soul and then walks grinning into the funeral. But you, children of space, you restless in rest, you shall not be trapped or tamed. Your house shall not be an anchor, but a mast. It shall not be a glistening film that covers a wound, but an island that guards your eye. You shall not fold your wings that you may pass through doors, nor bend your heads that it will strike not against the ceiling, nor fear to breathe lest walls should crack and fall down. You should not dwell in tombs made by the dead for the living. And through and though your magnificence and splendor, your house shall not hold your secret nor shelter your longing. For that which is boundless in you abides in the mansion of the sky, whose door is the morning midst, and whose windows are the songs and the silences of the night. That's an interesting one. <laughs> I like my house. I like staying inside and playing video games all day, but here's our good buddy Khalil Gabron saying, hey, go outside. Go out and experience. The world is your house, and there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do out there. A house is meant to keep you cooked up. A house is meant to like keep things in, keep you from going out and experiencing the really big things. Like he mentioned, and tell me of these people, Orphalees, what have you in these houses? And what is it that you guard with fastened doors? Have you peace, the quiet urge that reveals your power? Have you remembrances, the glimmering arches that span the summits of the mind? So do you have peace in your house? No, you can only find peace outside. Do you have remembrances? Do you have memories? Well, maybe you have one or two from like a dinner party or something like that, but chances are the greater majority of your memories and your adventures happen outside of your house have you beauty that leads the heart from the fashioned of wood and stone to the holy mountain can you really see beauty in your house when you're all locked up and cooked away or do you have to go out and experience beauty do you have to go see the hilltop do you have to go see the stone and the wood do you have to go see beautiful people and beautiful souls or can you do that all in your house so it's a call to action it's a call to adventure that he's giving us here and he's saying to be cooped up is to be kind of a bad thing so don't stay inside all day definitely go out and experience life and be a child of spacelessness as he said but you children of space you restless and rest you shall not be trapped nor tamed 
I'm restless and rest a lot. When I go to bed at night, I always think of myself, I'm like, man, I, I'm thinking of all the things that I could be doing if I didn't have to sleep right now. And that's a good place to be because that means that the next day that you live or the next time that you have, I think the music is still playing, right? Do, 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 do. Oh, now it's raining thunderstorms. Cool. <laughs> there we go. Let's go back. Sorry, I'm just setting the mood here. But getting back to it, you restless and rest. So to live each day that the next day you're like, man, I can't imagine what I'm going to do tomorrow. I wish I didn't have to sleep because there's so many good things going on and I just want to go out and experience them all. That's who Gilbron is talking to at this point. So go out and do something. But don't do it right now because the corona is in town. But if you are going to do something, if you are going to go out and experience something, do it safely. Um, but in general, don't stay cooped up in your house for too long. It's bad for your mental health and it's bad for the the digestion and all that other good stuff. So here's our good buddy, Cahill Gilbron, telling you to go out and experience some stuff. Now, on to the notion of clothes. These little guys right here. And the weaver said, speak to us of clothes. And he answered, your clothes conceal much of your beauty, yet they hide not the unbeautiful. And though you seek in garments the freedom of privacy, you may find in them a harness and a chain. Would that you could meet the sun and the wind with more of your skin and less of your raiment. For the breath of life is in the sunlight and the hand of life in the wind. Some of you say it is in the north wind who has woven the clothes we wear. And I say, aye, it was the north wind. But shame was his loom, and the softening of sinews was his thread. And when his work was done, he laughed in the forest. Forget not that modesty is for a shield against the eye of the unclean. And when the unclean shall be no more, what was modesty but a fetter and a fouling of the mind? And forget not that earth delights to feel you bare your feet, and the winds long to play with your hair. That's a really short one. That's a one-pager right there. All that we read is just that right there. Oh, wait, hold on. There we go, chat. That's all we just read. One page. So our buddy Gilbron wanted to be a nudist, apparently. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's a couple things that I want to draw your attention to in this passage. First of which is that your clothes conceal much of your beauty that they do not hide the unbeautiful. So if you're a total butthole, no clothes are going to make you not be a butthole. In fact, if you're really well-dressed and then you're a butthole, that makes you like a bigger butthole because if you're well-dressed and well-refined, it's expected that you have manners and that you treat people right, things like that. So it's like a butthole amplifier, if that makes sense. But getting back to it, this is getting into like a crazy literary review. Um, and the other thing is that I think Gilbron's very much a naturalist. He likes the natural order of things. He likes nature and things like that. And he says, and when, and forget not that the earth delights to fill your bare feet and the wind longs to play with your hair. So again, go outside, but don't like cover your body too, too much that you miss out on the experience of life, that you don't feel the sun radiating down on you and giving you warmth and all those things. So don't let clothing be a barrier to your experience in that way. And then finally, the last theme that I want to draw your attention to here is the notion of modesty. Excuse me. <clears throat> do, 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 do. Forget not that modesty is a shield against the eye of the unclean. And when the unclean shall be no more, what was modesty but a fetter and fouling of the mind? So there are people who look creepily on scantily clad men and women. I won't say much more about it, but yeah, modesty is important, but the bigger problem is that people look unscrupulously now granted like don't go out dressed half naked or don't like wear conservative clothing like within the ramifications of what's societally acceptable but at the same time it's like i worry a lot about i think a lot about the like, kids that i do youth ministry for i'm a youth minister at my church by the way and so i think a lot about the world that I'm sending these kids out into and what I'm preparing them for and how there may be some eyes that are looking at them rather unscrupulously. And maybe I'm thinking too much into it, but I think that's what Gilbron is saying here. The problem is not modesty. The problem is that there are people that look creepily at people who aren't dressed modestly. 
and thusly modesty is a futile exercise in trying to abate that versus just trying to fix the problem of people looking creepily at people other people i should say and that's all i'm going to say about that now we're going to talk about buying and selling getting that bag commerce stonks all those things and a merchant said speak to us of buying and selling and he answered and said to your earth yields her fruit and you shall not want if you but know how to fill your hands it is in exchanging the gifts of the earth that you shall find abundance and be satisfied Yet unless the exchange be in love and kindly justice, it will not but lead somewhere to greed and others to hunger. When in the market, place your toilers of the sea and fields and vineyards, meet the weavers and the potters and the gatherers of spices. Invoke then the master spirit of the earth to come into your midst and sanctify the scales and the reckoning that weighs value against value. And suffer not the barren handed to take part in your transactions who would sell their worlds for your labor. To such men you should say, Come with us to the field, or go out with our brothers to the sea, and cast your net. For the land and the sea shall be bountiful to you as to us. And if there comes the singers and the dancers and the flute players, buy of their gifts also. For they too are gatherers of fruit and frankincense. And that which they bring, though fashioned of dreams, is raiment and food of your soul. And before you leave the marketplace, see that no one has gotten on the way to make, or gone his way with empty hands. For the master spirit of the earth shall not be slept peacefully upon the wind till the needs of at least of you are satisfied. So that's another biblical reference there. In the Gospel of Matthew, I believe it is, Jesus is talking to his people and his disciples, not just his people, his disciples. And he says, gracious are you because when I was hungry, you gave me food to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. And when I was tired, you gave me rest. And then the apostles say, wait, Jesus, we didn't do any of that for you. He said, nay, whatever you so do for my lowliest child or whatever you do for the least of me, you do also for me. And so I think Gilbron's alluding to that in here. For the master spirit of the earth shall not sleep peacefully upon the wind till the needs of the least of you are satisfied. That's an analogy to that passage in the Gospel of Matthew, in my opinion. So buying and selling. Don't buy and sell just to get a bag. Buy and sell and do things for people so that you have a purpose or you do it with the intent of helping somebody sell your things in such a way that it nurtures them it feeds them it feeds their soul it feeds their body it does something and aim your work and your buying and your selling and all your business towards that goal and make sure that even if sometimes people don't have any money like make sure that nobody leaves the market empty-handed that's what he's saying so if you can give to somebody without losing out or if you see somebody has nothing and you are within your will to gay or to give i should say um then do that go and give them make sure that nobody leaves with empty hands be charitable in your business i guess is what he's trying to say there now a big one crime and punishment then one of the judges of the city stood forth and said speak to us of crime and punishment and not the book by Dostoevsky, the idea of crime and punishment. So little literary joke. Crime and punishment, it's a Russian piece of literature by Dostoevsky. It's very thick, like most Russian books are, because the Russians were cold for eight months out of the year because it snows eight months out of the year and is cold eight months out of the year. So all they did was sit inside and write books. And so Russian books are very, very thick. But getting back to this book that we're reading, speak to us of crime and punishment. And he answered, saying, It is when your spirit goes wandering upon the wind that you alone and unguarded commit a... Sorry, let me start over. It is when your spirit goes wandering up on the wind that you, alone and unguarded, commit a wrong unto others and therefore unto yourself. And for that wrong committed must you knock and wait a while unheeded at the gate of the blessed. Like the ocean is your God self. It remains for the undefiled. And like the ether, it lifts but it but the winged. Even like the sun is your god self. It knows not the ways of the mole, nor seeks its holes of the serpent. But your god self dwells, not alone your being. Much of you is still in man, and much of you is not yet in man, but a shapeless pygmy that walks asleep in the mist, searching for his own awakening. And the man in you would I now speak. 
For it is he, and not you, and not your God self, nor the pygmy in the mist that knows crime and the punishment of crime. Oftentimes have I heard you speak of one who commits a wrong as though he were not one of you, but a stranger unto you and an intruder upon your world. But I say that even as the holy and righteous cannot rise beyond the highest which is each one of you, so the wicked and also the weak cannot fall than the lowest of which of you is also. And as a single leaf turns not yellow, but with the silent knowledge of the whole tree, so the wrongdoer cannot do wrong without the hidden will of you all. Like a procession, you walk together towards your God self. You are the way and the wayfarers. And when one of you falls down, he falls for those behind him, a caution against the stumbling stone. Aye, and if he falls, for those ahead of him, who thought faster and surer of foot, yet move not the stumbling stone. And this also, though the world lie heavy upon your hearts, the murdered is not unaccountable for his own murder, and the robbed is not blameless in being robbed. The righteous is not innocent of the deeds of the wicked, and the white-handed is not clean of the doings of the felon. Yet the guilty is oftentimes the victims of the injured, and still more of the condemned is the burden-bearer for the guiltless and unblamed. You cannot separate the just from the unjust and the good from the wicked, for they stand together before the face of the sun, even as the black thread and the white are woven together. And when the black thread breaks, the weaver shall look into it the whole cloth, and he shall examine the loom also. If any of you would bring to judgment an unfaithful wife, let him also weigh the heart of her husband in the scales, and measure his soul with measurements. And let him who would lash the offender look unto the spirit of the offended. And if any of you would punish in the name of righteousness and lay the axe unto the evil tree, let him see to its roots. And verily he will find in the roots the good and the bad, the fruitful and the fruitless, all entwined together in the silent heart of the earth. And you judges who would be just, what judgment pronounce you upon him who, though honest in the flesh, yet is a thief in the spirit? What penalty lay you upon him who slays in the flesh, yet is himself slain in the spirit? And how prosecute you him who is in action a deceiver and an oppressor, yet who is also aggravated and outraged? And how shall you punish those who are remorse and already greater than, than their mindsets? Or, I'm sorry. And how shall you punish those who are remorse is already greater in their misdeeds? Is not remorse the justice which is administered by that very law which you would fain serve? Yet you cannot lay remorse upon the innocent, nor lift it from the heart of the guilty. Unbidden shall it call in the night, the men may wake and gaze upon themselves. And you who would understand justice, how shall you, unless you look upon all your deeds in the fullness of light? Only then shall you know that the erect and the fallen are but one man standing in twilight between the night of his pygmy self and the day of his god self. And then the cornerstone of the temple is not higher than the lowest stone in its foundation. That's a good one. It's a little bit longer, but there's a lot to dissect here. So let's talk about it after I take a quick hydration break. I'm drinking a lot of water. Staying hydrated, chat. We love to see it. There's a really great analogy here that I'm going to use another poet to draw on. Give me one second here while I pull this book from my shelf. <laughs> Talked about him earlier, but Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe has an excellent poem called The Imp of the Perverse. And The Imp of the Perverse is an excellent, excellent poem. And I'm not going to read it to you right here, but I wanted to pull this out for dramatic effect. But I'm going to set it down over here. The Imp of the Perverse is a story about a guy that's basically gone insane and murdered somebody. And he talks about the inner turmoil that we feel between being demented and evil and being good and righteous. And so when Gabron is talking about the pygmy self and the god self, the pygmy self is, you know giving into your evil desires and doing evil and your god self is walking the path of righteousness and so the that's a that's a good analogy here and it's kind of interesting to see two of poets kind of talk about these at completely separate times and completely separate areas so if you want to read more on this notion definitely check out the imp of the perverse by edgar Allan poe but getting back to our good friend mr khalil gobron 
There's another thing that I want to draw your attention to here, and he talks about the unilateralness of crime and that we live in a society. I'm not, I'm not going to make that weird joke, but uh, life is hard. The world is hard. And before I say anything else, I don't want to sound like an apologist. I don't want to say that people don't deserve justice or I don't, I don't mean to say that people that do bad things shouldn't answer for their crimes. They most certainly should. But what I'm saying here is that there may be some factors at play as part of the greater community or society that somebody lives in that can play towards their being convicted of a crime or them committing a crime. Now notice that there, I'd say two things there. There's being convicted of a crime and there's committing a crime. People commit crimes all the time and aren't convicted and people are convicted of crimes that they never do. And so not only do you have to examine the traits that would drive somebody to commit a crime, things like revenge, infidelity, rage, frustration, all these other things, but you have to also consider the societal consequences of things like systematic racism, oppression, all these systems in place that can convict somebody on circumstantial basis or circumstantial evidence without any real proof. And all of these problems cumulatively are the black and the white thread that Gil Brown is talking about. So good people are intertwined with bad people. We live in a world where there are some bad people that commit bad crimes, but it's on the good people to shape society and to make the world a better place so that those bad people are few and far between. And if there are bad people, that we put a focus on not just putting them away and making them suffer, but instead rehabilitating them and fixing the problems that may have driven them to do wrongful things. And it's really hard to get a grasp of this because in Western culture, we are so fixated on justice and righteousness and, oh, I'm going to make him pay. Or I'm going to go mess that guy up for doing this thing to me. Like I have to right the wrongs and everything like that. It's really frustrating. That's a very frustrating and a very short-handed way of saying things. And again, I'm not saying that if a crime is committed against you that you shouldn't seek justice. You certainly should. But there is a imbalance between the amount of righteousness that we seek in Western culture and the amount of wrongdoing. People want to seek infinite judgment or infinite retribution for finite lapses in judgment or finite problems. Uh, or finite crimes, I should say. And that's why we have a code of laws and we, and we have like minimum sentencing and things like that so that we can quantify the amount of recompense or the amount of debt that people have to pay back to society through prison or community service and things like that. But we don't often put focus on what happens in that time. Like community service and going to prison and stuff like that, those are meant to be real rehabilitative tools. Those are meant to be times where you can think about what you did and make the decision to become a better person or get the help that you need to become better. But we don't hear about this at all in Western culture, sadly, because people often, the prison system here in the United States for one is completely backwards. And I could spend a whole three hours talking about that and not even scratch the surface, but I'll keep it short and say that the American justice system or the American prison system isn't focused on rehabilitating people. It is focused on recidivism and seeing if there are ways to make repeat offenders so that you can continue to use them for basically slave labor in the imprisoned industrial complex or to kind of just put your problems away and sweep it under the rug without addressing the societal issues like people being criminally insane in times or rampant sexual abuse in the world that's causing people to you know have deviant sexual behavior and things like that that can eventually lead into crime so we don't want to fix those problems. We just want to sweep them under the rug. And prison is that metaphorical rug. But if you look at other places in the world, like Japan, Japan's a great system, at least in my opinion, because Japan puts a lot of focus on rehabilitation, especially with juvenile crimes. Like juvenile crimes in Japan are very heavily like, hey, let's get you in rehabilitation. Let's not like send you to prison and let's not have you like feel in a cage and like feel the, the existential dread of being cooped up in a cell when you're only 15 or 16 years old, like let's work on rehabilitation and making sure that you can still be a productive member of society later in life for minor crimes, of course. Obviously, if it's a major crime, then prison is pretty much all that there is. But yeah, 
all that's to say the black thread and the white thread let's talk about it uh hey drew hope you're doing all right thank you so much at major b thank you for stopping by let me see here yeah welcome to uh let's see here welcome to my little section of twitch the a's for drew channel and we're doing our well-read wednesday and we're currently reading the prophet by hill gabron and we just read a passage on crime and punishment so pretty existential stuff and i was just talking about how the western judicial system is really focused on kind of sweeping problems under the rug and in some cases that works but we should really put our focus on rehabilitating people who go to jail and things like that or you know people that commit crimes we should work on rehabilitating them when we can because as gobron says the black and the white thread are intertwined good people and bad people are intertwined and it's on the good people to fix the problems in society that are maybe aiding and abetting bad people to doing bad things so yeah that's crime and punishment and my long soliloquy on justice so let's talk a little bit about laws which is the natural progression <clears throat> but i'm going to take a quick swig here make sure to hydrate chat it's important we're back for double hydration let's see we're about halfway through we're doing good so then a lawyer said but what of laws master and he answered you delight in laying down laws yet you delight more in breaking them like children playing by the ocean who build sand towers with consistency and then destroy them with laughter but while you build your sand towers the ocean brings more sand to the shore and when you destroy them the ocean laughs with you verily the ocean laughs always with the innocent but what of those to whom life is not an ocean and man-made laws are not sand towers but to whom life is a rock and the law is a chisel with which they would carve into their own likeness what of the cripple who hates dancers what of the ox who loves his yoke and deems the elk and deer of the forest stray and vagrant things what of the old serpent who cannot shed his skin and calls all others naked and shameless and of him who comes early to the wedding feast and when overfed and tired goes his way saying that all feasts are a violation and all feasters lawbreakers what shall i say of these that they too stand in the sunlight but with their back to the sun they see only their shadows and their shadows their laws and what is the sun to them but a caster of shadows and what is to acknowledge the laws but to stoop down and trace their shadows upon the earth but you who walk facing the sun what images drawn on the earth can hold you you who travel with the wind with what weather vane shall direct your course what man's law shall bind you if you break your yoke but upon no man's prison door what laws shall you fear if you dance but stumble again no man in irons chains and who is he that shall bring to you judgment if you tear off your garment yet leave it in no man's path people of orphalese you can mumple the drum and you can loosen the strings of the lyre but who shall command the skylark not to sing hmm interesting passage there i need a minute to digest it for myself so okay i think i got it so gabron is saying in this moment that there's kind of a again we're talking about the naturalism gabron is really big on like the natural discussion or discussion of natural things and so he's saying here that there's kind of a natural order and a natural law to things so what man's law shall bind you if you break your yoke but upon no man's prison door what law shall you fear if you dance but stumble against no man's iron chains so what law do you break when you do things naturally and you do things within the realm of that that kind of understanding and you who travel with the wind what weather vane shall direct your course it's the wind the you don't get to say where the wind takes you you kind of just have to follow the wind because it's a natural thing so there is a natural law and a natural order to things and man-made laws are always in search of that man-made law or that man-made equilibrium i guess you could call it so all that in mind laws seek to unite justice with the natural order of things and it's just like the wind the wind is kind of naturally moving and so we have to play along with the wind and so 
in making laws, we adjust our sails to meet the wind and take us where we need to go. That's my reading of it, anyway. Let's see here. Just checking how much longer we have. Oh, we're almost like, we're exactly halfway. So there's 84 pages and we're on page 42. So, let's talk about freedom. And an orator said, speak to us of freedom. And he answered, at the city gate and by your fireside, I have seen you prostrate yourself and worship your own freedom. Even as slaves humble themselves before a tyrant and praise him through, though he slays them. I, in the grove of the temple and in the shadow of the citadel, I have seen the freest among you wear their freedom as a yoke and a handcuff. And my heart bled within me. For you can only be free when even the desire of seeking freedom becomes a harness to you. And when you cease to speak of freedom as a goal and a fulfillment. You shall be free indeed when your days are not without a care and your nights without a want and grief. But rather when these things griddle your life and let you rise above them naked and unbound. And how shall you rise beyond your days and nights unless you break the chains which you are at the dawn and your understanding have fastened around you at the noon hour? In truth, that which you call freedom is the strongest of these change, though its links glitter in the sun and dazzle your eyes. And what is it but fragments of your own self you would discard that you may become free? If it is an unjust law, you would abolish. The law was written with your own hand upon your own forehand. You cannot erase it by burning your law books, nor by washing the foreheads of your judges, though you pour your sea upon them. And if it is a despot, you would dethrone. See first that his throne is erected within you destroyed. For how can a tyrant rule the free and the proud, but for a tyranny in their own freedom and shame in their own pride? And if it is a care you would cast off, then a care has been chosen by you rather than imposed upon you. And if it is fear you would dispel, the seed of that fear is your heart, and not in the hand of the feared. Verily, all things move within your being in a constant half-embrace, the desired and the dreaded, the repugnant and the cherished, the pursued that you wish would escape. These things move within you as lights and shadows and pairs the cling. Welcome back, Panda. And when the shadow fades and is no more, the light that lingers becomes a shadow to another light. And thus your freedom, when it loses its fetters, becomes itself the fetter of a greater freedom. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Freedom is a very abstract idea. Because I think freedom is really a relative term. There's... Andrew's a great story reader. I enjoy following asleep to him reading. I, I'd kill for that, not going to lie. Absolutely. So just so you know, Panda, uh, I'm going to be uploading all of these onto my YouTube channel, and I'll be doing some editing so that it's just kind of like the poem parts. So yeah, you should check out my YouTube channel. If you type in exclamation socials, actually, let me do that right now. Do, 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 do. Socials. You can check out my Mechanics GG profile. And actually... Oh, I think it's YouTube. There we go. Yeah, check out my my Mechanics GG profile, and you can see all my pages. And just go over to my YouTube channel, and be sure to link up there, and you can find all the vods for these. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the kind words, though. Um, freedom is an abstract thought. Freedom is a relativistic idea because freedom in one nation and one set of laws is very different from freedom in another nation and another set of laws. And I think. Gilbron is alluding to that really quickly or in these writings because he says for how can a tyrant rule the free and be proud but for a tyranny in their own freedom and shame in their own pride so how can a tyrant so a dictator how would he how can a tyrant rule the free and the proud but for a tyranny in their own freedom and shame and a shame in their own pride so Somebody can rule the free. Somebody can have power over you. But relatively speaking, the system of governance around you is what dictates the notion of freedom. So short of a man coming up and literally shackling you and physically binding you like a tyrant having rule over the free, metaphorically speaking, and the greater idea or the greater notion of what freedom is it's all relativistic it's all based on what is freedom is freedom just a freedom from being bound is it freedom from being in prison is it freedom from dictatorship is it freedom 
of thought. So freedom is relativistic based on what you're talking about. And so I think that's what Gil Braun is saying here is that you have to keep a relativistic mindset. There's no, I guess, one really true freedom that we can abstract as humans. We just have to keep it relativistic and we have to keep it within the notions of the world in which we live. So thank you so much, Panda. I really appreciate it. I've been told my voice is kind of soothing. So this is a really hard one, guys. Um, I'd have to go back and reread it a couple times and really meditate on it. But I guess if nothing else, I think the takeaway is just that freedom is somewhat relativistic. So yeah. Panda, I was going to say too, if there's any short stories that you really like or you want me to read like in the next week's stream, then I can definitely do that. Just leave them in my recommendations. I'll make a note of them and I'll be sure to read them over the week and then I'll see if I can uh, put them up on stream. So yeah, if you've got any recommendations, drop them in there. So yeah. Making our way through the book. Here's a good one. Reason and Passion. And the priestess spoke again and said, Speak to us on reason and passion. And he answered, saying, Your soul is oftentimes a battlefield, upon which your reason and your judgment wage war against your passion and your appetite. Would that I could be a peacemaker in your soul, that I might turn the discord and the rivalry of your elements into oneness and melody. But how shall I, unless you yourselves be also peacemakers, nay, the lovers of all of your elements? Your reason and your passion are the rudder and the sails of your seafaring soul. If either your sails or your rudder be broken, you can but toss and drift, or else be held at a standstill in mid-seas. For reason, ruling alone is a force confining, and passion unattended is a flame that burns to its own destruction. Therefore, let your soul exalt your reason to the height of passion, that it may sing. And let it direct your passion with reason, that your passion may live through its own daily resurrection, and like the phoenix, rise above its own ashes. I would have you consider your judgment and your appetite even as you would two loved guests in your house. Surely you would not honor one guest above the other, for he who is more mindful of one loses the love and the faith of both. Among the hills, when you sit in your cool shade of the white poplars, staring the peace and serenity of the distant fields and meadows, then let your heart say in silence, God rests in reason. And when the storm comes and the mighty wind shakes the forest and the thunder and lightning proclaim the majesty of the sky, then let your heart say in awe, God moves in passion. And since you are a breath in God's sphere and a leaf in God's forest, you too should rest in reason and move in passion. I like that. That's really concise. Um, it is, I think it's probably the most concise one that we've seen so far. So here's Gilbron saying that there's two things at play here. There is reason and there is passion. So reason comes to us in the quiet times when we're kind of relaxing, as he says, when the, or among the hills, when you sit in the cool shade of the white poplars, staring the peace and serenity of distant fields. So when everything's chill and all this other sort of stuff, that's when we can sit and we can relax and our brains can abstract reason and we can understand reason and logical things. But on the other side of the coin, when the storm comes and the mighty wind shakes the forest and the thunder and lightning proclaim the majesty of the sky, then let your heart say in awe, God moves in passion. So sometimes there's just crazy stuff that's going on out around us. You've got thunderstorms and all this other crazy stuff and it's all hectic and really there's no way to kind of sit and reason through things so you just have to rely on passion so to be a well-rounded individual to know god and to know life is to have an understanding of both passion and reason so you gotta have reason and you gotta have passion one without the other is a bad thing because like you said passion is a flame that consumes itself and reason what did he say like the phoenix there for reason ruling alone is a force confining and passion unattended is a flame that burns its own destruction so yeah have reason and have passion not one without the other lest you be a fire that burns itself up or you confine yourself to reason and have no passion behind it so yeah here's a big one tell us about pain and not just the six pass of pain from Naruto Shippuden. I'm actually watching through Shippuden again, and it is a fantastic show. I'm actually on the pain arc, so that's the first thing that I thought of when it said pain, but let's get back to it. And a woman spoke, saying, tell us of pain. And he said, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. 
Even as the stone of the fruit must break, that its heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life, your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. And you would accept the seasons of your heart, even as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. And you would watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. Much of your pain is self-chosen. It is the bitter potion by which the physician with you, within you heals your sick self. Therefore, trust the physician, and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. For his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. And the cup he brings, though it burns your lips, has been fashioned of the clay with the potter, has moistened with his own sacred tears. Short, sweet, to the point, as we know Gilbron is. So, there's a lot to take in there. We're going to give some snaps here for Gilbron. That was some poetry slam right there. So... A lot of poets like to sit and soliloquy on pain. What is pain? What is suffering? Oh, woe is me. But here's Gilbron saying that pain is self-chosen. Like a lot of the time, you get yourself into this hole, homie. Like this pain is your own undoing. This is a hell of your own creation. But is the bitter potion by which the physician heals your sick self. So it's how we learn. Pain is how we learn. It's how we heal the sick self. Therefore, trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. So... Take your lumps, don't whine and complain, take the pain, learn from it. I don't want to say don't be quiet and don't complain because if you're legitimately hurting or like if you're feeling mental anguish, then you should probably talk to somebody. But for a little stuff here and there, like take your medicine, learn your lesson and move on. So take it in silence and tranquility. For the hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. The unseen being here God. And... The cup he brings, though it burns your lips, has been fashioned of the clay which the potter, the potter capitalized here, again alluding to God, has moistened with his own sacred tears. So God is sometimes giving you this pain, but he's right there to be there with you, I guess you could say. And the pain or the tears that he is using to moisten the clay is him suffering with you. So kind of a biblical picture there, and I like that a lot. So... That's this particular passage. I know my favorite passage was from the passage I'm giving, but a lot of people cite this particular. Um, Panda's dropping some Japanese on me. Very nice. I'll have to check what that is later. But a lot of people like to cite this particular passage. Um, much of your pain is self chosen. It's the bitter potion that the physician uses to heal you. So that's a lot of people like to cite Gilbron, or they use that particular passage as like one of his greater pieces. So. Yeah, that's pain. Now let's talk about self-knowledge, or knowledge of the self, kind of introspection, I guess you can say. And a man said, speak to us of self-knowledge. And he answered, saying, your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and the nights, but your ears thirst for the sound of your heart's knowledge. You would know in words that which you have always known and thought. You would touch with them your fingers, the naked body of your dreams. And it is well you should, the hidden wellspring of your soul must need rise and run murmuring to the sea. And the treasure of your infinite depths would be revealed to your eyes. But let there be no scales to weigh you your unknown treasure. And seek not depths of your knowledge with staff of sounding line. For self is a sea boundless and measureless. Say not, I have found the truth, but rather, I have found a truth. Say not, I have found the path of the soul. Say rather, I have met the soul walking upon my path. For the soul walks upon all paths. The soul walks not upon a line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like a lotus of countless petals. Yeah, so it's in the experience that we learn about ourselves. And we have, our soul is kind of unearthed. It flows out like a petal, like petals on a lotus flower. Which a lotus, if you've never seen a lotus, is a beautiful flower. And there's a lot of... Lotuses get used a lot in like symbolism because they grow in swamps basically they grow in the mud and then whenever it comes time for them to bloom they bloom and they have this most beautiful bloom and it's like a lotus is blooming in the middle of a desolate plain so a lot of people like to use that analogy for like oh I'm growing through the uh, the, the sad or the hard parts that are in my life but to know the self is to go out into life and to experience so say i don't say i found the truth but rather i have found a truth through my experience i have found some semblance of truth i haven't found the absolute truth but i found a truth 
And then say not, I have found the path of the soul. Say rather, I have met the soul walking upon my path. He's literally telling you right then and there that you will find your soul if you are walking along your path. For the soul walks upon all paths. So we all find our souls when we're walking on our path. And the soul walks not upon the line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like the lotus of countless petals. So it blooms as we go along. It doesn't grow steadily. It kind of blooms with our experience. So yeah, I love lotuses. They're beautiful flowers. I should start growing lotuses. That'd be fun. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about teaching. After I take a little swig of water here. <clears throat> then said a teacher speak to us of teaching and he said no man can reveal you to you aught but what what is already ah sorry let me start over no man can reveal to you aught but what that was already lies half asleep in the dawning of your knowledge the teacher who walks in the shadow of the temple among his followers gives not of his wisdom but rather of his faith and his lovingness if he is indeed wise, he does not bid you enter the house of wisdom, but rather lead you to the threshold of your own mind. The astronomer may speak to you of his understanding of space, but he cannot give you his understanding. The musician may sing of you the rhythm which is in all space, but he cannot give you the ear which arrests the rhythm, nor the voice that echoes it. And he who is versed in science of numbers can tell you of the regions of weight and measure, but he cannot conduct you tither. For the vision of one man leads not to its wings to another man. And even as each one of you stands alone in God's knowledge, so must each of you be alone in his knowledge of God and his understanding of the earth. Interesting. So talking about teachers, talking about how a teacher can lead you to the threshold. So like he said, he can... He doesn't walk you to the door or through the door of the house of knowledge, but rather takes you to the threshold of your own knowledge. So a teacher isn't meant to take you to understanding. It's meant he's meant to he or she is meant to show you how to reason and how to find your own knowledge. And I like to sum this up because I say it a lot to my friends and I say it whenever I'm teaching somebody something, I always say, I'm not going to challenge what you think, but I'm going to, to challenge you to think. And there's a big parallel there because you can propose an idea but you can't impose an idea you can propose a faith but you can't impose a faith you can propose knowledge but you can't impose knowledge people have to find that knowledge themselves people have to find that understanding themselves so don't think of challenging what somebody thinks but instead challenge them to think about it and our good buddy Khalil is or Khalil is echoing that as well Here's a good one for you guys. This is about friendship. And a youth said, speak to us of friendship. And he answered saying, your friend is your needs answered. He is your field which you sow with love and reap with thanksgiving. And he is your broad and your fireside. For you, for you come to him with your hunger and you seek him for peace. When your friend speaks his mind, you fear not the nay in your own mind, nor do you withhold the a. And when he is silent, your heart ceases not to listen to his heart. For without words, in a friendship, all thoughts, all desires, and all expectations are born and shared with joy that is unacclaimed. When you part from your friend, you grieve not. For that which you love most in him may be clear in his absence. And the mountain to the climber is clear from the pain. And let there be no purpose in friendship save the deep deafening of the spirit. For love that seeks aught might be the disclosure of his own mystery is not love but a net cast forth, and only the unprofitable is caught. And let your best friend be for your friend. If he must know the up of your tide, let him know its flood also. For what is your friend that you should seek him with, with hours to kill? Seek him always with hours to live. For it is with, for it is his fill your need, but not your emptiness. And in the sweetness of friendship, let there be laughter and sharing of pleasures. For in the dew of little things, the heart finds its morning and is refreshed. Nice. So talking about friends and how friends kind of compliment you and not compliment you like, oh, I love your shoes or I love your hair, but they are your needs answered. 
So a friend can usually meet you where you're at. They can give you a objective view of things because sometimes we get into our own heads and we start to think things negatively about ourselves. So a friend can oftentimes give a lot of perspective or objective view into what you have going on in your life. So keep your friends close, keep them very close. <laughs> keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer as they say no, but keep your friends close and keep them. A good friend is kind of the answer to your needs. And so be on the lookout for people like that who answer your needs as you have them and then go from there. Yeah. Watch out, I don't know where the time went. We've already been live for two whole hours. Can you believe that? I'll tell you what, I wanted to get to the last question by Isaac Aspinall, but it's getting kind of late and I'm getting a little bit tired. And I think two hours is a good place to stop. So I'm gonna read just one more poem and then we'll pick up after next week with we'll finish the prophet and then we'll start in on the last question by isaac asmanov which is one of my favorite science fiction stories so finally our final poem for this evening <laughs> ironically and then a scholar said speak to us of talking and he answered saying you talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts and when you can no longer dwell in the solitude of your heart you live in your lips or you live in your lips and sound is a, is a diversion and a pastime. And in much of your talking, thinking is half murdered. For thought is a bird of space, that in a cage of words may indeed unfold its wings, but cannot fly. There are those among you who seek the talkative through fear of being alone. The silence of aloneness reveals to the eyes their naked selves, and they would escape. And there are those who walk, who talk, and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. In the bosom of such as these spirit dwells in the rhythmic silence. When you meet your friend on the roadside of the marketplace, let the spirit in you move your lips and direct your tongue. Let the voice within you speak to the ear of his ear, for his soul will keep the truth of your heart as the taste of the wine is remembered, when the color is forgotten and the vessel is no more. I think the biggest takeaway on this one is you talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts. And that's a big one because I've always been a big proponent of the notion that you have to listen before you can talk. Like if you're talking, if you're, I'm talking here right now, so chances are you're listening. You're not talking back, but if I take a pause right here, you have a second to rebuke or talk about what I'm talking about. So whenever we're talking, sometimes we're listening, but we're also kind of most of the time we're the ones that are talking and other people are listening and conversely when people are talking it's on us to listen and to listen attentively so in that way i think gilbron is taking that one step further here when he says that you talk when you become uncomfortable with your thoughts so when you don't understand something or you don't really get the whole picture that's when you start talking because you've been listening for a while and you're uncomfortable with what you have. Maybe you don't have all the pieces or you're having a rough time making sense of everything. And so that's why you talk. That's why you seek to understand. Or maybe there's just something that's in your head that's bugging at you, or there's something that you're desired with, or you just can't leave it at just a thought. You have to do something about it. Maybe you want to go do something great, or maybe you want to seek justice or do something good for somebody else. And so that's when you become uncomfortable with your thoughts. And so I think the big takeaway there is to not feel like when he's saying uncomfortable, it's not saying that you're like, so in your head, it's like, oh, I have to say something. It's just like, at this point, these thoughts need to become actions or I need to do something about these thoughts for better or for worse. And so that's the takeaway there. So yeah, we've gotten through probably a good five eighths of the book. Actually, I think it's exactly five eighths because we're on page 52 of like 80. So. I'm going to sleeve this guy back up for now, and we will get back to him next week. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Like I said, The Prophet is an amazing book, and it has a lot of great wisdom, and it's a book that you kind of keep on your shelf, and when you need wisdom or you need advice, you go back to it, and there's topics for just about everything. We've talked about love. We've talked about marriage. We've talked about friendship. We've talked about talking. <laughs> That's ironic. So... This is definitely a book that you keep on your shelf and you reference every once in a while. You don't read it one time and then you're done with it. So, And Gilbron is very concise. He likes the natural order of things. He understands that there's a natural way that things go. 
And so I really like that. He's a very down-to-earth, very rational, and very realistic and concise writer. And so that's why I really love his poetry. So thank you guys so much for stopping by. We're going to be doing this every Wednesday. I really enjoy reading with you guys. And I like, I've, I've been getting some feedback that I have a really soothing voice. So thank you guys so much for those of you who say that. I, I love that you enjoy listening to my voice. And hopefully we can share that with more people. So definitely tune in next week. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I do stream every Wednesday. Uh, for Well Read Wednesday starts around 8, 830 Central Standard Time. So if you can, follow me. Check out my Mechanics GG profile down in the description below and hopefully you can stop by for a live stream otherwise you can check these out every thursday i usually upload the full video and then i'll edit down the books once i finish a full story i edit it into like a a super cut and then i upload that once it's finished so yeah we will wrap it up right there thank you guys so much for stopping by and i will see you next week until next time guys stay reading and stay happy